have to give up my US citizenship to get that. A lot of people stole the video. I think COVID really hurt it. Say bad words. I would say is uh, trash. Dogs are stolen here for food. Get a lawyer, everyone. Uh, it's very difficult to make a comfortable living. Most of the marriage petitions are fake. What would have done if you didn't go down this path and being a successful YouTuber? That's a great question. Offering $50,000, $70,000 to fake marry their daughter yeah. to bring them to America. People are very touchy. Go to dangerous places, rub my head in a racist way. Hello everybody, uh, welcome back to uh, Jung Global's uh, show. My name is Ken Jung. I'm actually here in front of the Culture Center uh, in District 1 at Pham Ngoc Pat. And when you talk about culture, you talk about people, and you talk about language in Vietnam, you cannot remiss by talking to this amazing person. He has an, a great channel, uh, has a lot of followers and a lot of subscribers as well, and he's just extremely funny and interesting. So I want to introduce to you, Mr. Phuc Mạc. Yeah. What's up, brother? It's a pleasure to see you again. Yeah, man. yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Kak bang oi, Phuc Mop day. Hey, everyone. My name's Hurley, or better known as Phuc Mop here in Vietnam. Happy to be here with you. Yeah, yeah. So today, uh, like I said, in front of the culture center, no non-Vietnamese person that speaks Vietnamese as well as you. And you speak so well, you can actually teach other people Vietnamese. So I'm actually very proud of that. And we got the same hairdo. Got the little beard going. Twinning today, guys. Uh, and then maybe I'll get some tattoos as well. <laughs> so with that said, um, I know you just came back to Vietnam. Uh, you go back and forth now. So specifically on this trip to Vietnam, what are you looking to do? And uh, Yeah, so uh, ever since COVID ended and my wife was able to go back and forth with America with me, uh, I've taken the opportunity to get out and explore more. Yeah. You know, during COVID, I was here almost three years. They said I could leave, but I couldn't come back. Yeah. My wife, she couldn't leave and go to America, so I wasn't gonna leave her here. Yeah. Uh, therefore, you know, I spent a lot of time just going to uh, Texas and Tennessee and Florida, uh, Georgia, Illinois, trying to meet the Vietnamese communities yeah. abroad because uh -huh. you know, I've spent nine years here. Now it's time to branch out and see some other people. But on this trip back, I've just been filming. You know, I've knocked out a lot of videos this month, a lot of collaborations, this yeah. one as well. and. Uh, it feels great to be back. It feels just like you're the ambassador of the U.S. to Vietnam, making a trip back to the U.S. to meet the Vietnamese community. Yes, sir. So uh, U.S. Ambassador Mark Knapper, he just did the whole round in the U.S. as well, oh, including really? Orange County, Northern California, Atlanta, D.C., of course, and uh, many other areas. So next time, I don't know if you know him, but uh, I'd love to introduce you. Oh, I would love to meet him. Because great ambassadors of Vietnam that want to share the Vietnam culture and you'd be one of really great ones. Yeah, I mean, obviously he knows enough about Vietnam to be the ambassador, and myself, uh, the Young Chi magazine, they called me the Dai Su Bac Biet Du Lek of Vietnam, the special ambassador of tourism, yeah. just for sharing, so I took that as a great honor, and now I look at it as my responsibility to share the positive aspects of the culture, the language, the food, the country, and everything. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, let's get, uh, we're gonna move around uh, here in District 1 and then ask him about his life, about his personal life, his business life, and also his future goals. That's something I'm excited to talk about, so let's get going. Let's do it. Well, as we always begin the program, we definitely want to know, and our audience wants to know, because uh, there are probably maybe about five people who don't know you. But for those five people, tell us how how did you get Phuc Map as a name? All right. Uh, and how did you become love Vietnam, or and then the language? All right, well, yeah. I'll summarize a long story, but basically, okay. you know, I uh, graduated UCF, uh, I was studying criminal justice and legal studies, uh, you know, okay. similar to your profession. Yeah. But uh, no offense, by the end I got a bit bored. Okay. Legal studies, legal writing, I just, I realized I didn't want to make that a career. Yeah. And then after I got out, you know, uh, some of my jiu-jitsu buddies, they said, hey, come work downtown Orlando with us, you know, and just hang out. Yeah. Well, I took it as continuing the party of college, worked as a bartender, yeah. and I liked it at first, but I realized it's a very toxic environment. And one of my uh, wise friends told me, you need to get out. You know, if yeah. you don't get out of this environment, you're going to wake up in 20 years and still be a bartender and probably be an alcoholic. Okay. So uh, I took it upon myself to look into teaching English as a means of getting out of the country. Yeah. Looked at a few countries, found Vietnam, and the plan was here for one year. Taiwan, Thailand, try it everywhere else. Yeah. And uh, I fell in love with the culture. And within a year, you know, I, I met a girl and I fell in love with her as well. Okay. And uh, that led to my 
uh, motivation to learn the language, not just for her, because obviously she speaks English, but her family, a very big family, does not. Yeah. I met her mom on maybe the third date and had to speak Vietnamese. I called her Tay. She yeah. said, you did not just call my mom Tay. No. I said, what? Well, she's older than me. It's respectful. And then I took it upon myself to get a uh, private tutor yeah. and study every week. And I've been with the same tutor for nearly seven years now. Oh, wow. Okay. And uh, from that, you know, my wife said, you know all this stuff about my country and my culture. Why don't you make a YouTube channel with it and share it with the rest of the world? Okay. Add your personality in, you know, make it humorous. Make something that people haven't seen here before. Yeah, yeah. And from there, you know, that's where the YouTube channel came from in uh, the beginning of 2019. So is your angle what they haven't seen before? Is a bald white guy who looks like Zed, uh, Led Zeppelin? I've gotten that reference that speaks before. Pretty much. Um, I just, in my life, you know, since being a kid and being of you know, the class clown nature, mm. I just like to make people laugh. Yep, so yep. whatever the topic is, I want to make people, you know, watch and just kind of like, at the very least, smile and snicker. Yeah. But, you know, obviously laugh out loud in front of their friends. And from the beginning, if you watch my earliest videos, they were so extreme, they were so over the top, you could tell that's my goal. And, you know, looking at where I'm at today, yeah. it seems it worked with the majority of people. Nice, nice. Well, we'll definitely transition over, you know, the personal side, a lot of people already know from your channel. Uh, we'll switch it over to a little bit about on the business side. Okay. Yeah. So as a uh, YouTuber and your business, there was a really hilarious video uh, that you made where you're just holding a chicken and then you were just talking, interacting with people and there was a lot of laughs. Could you tell us a little bit more about that? Because it went viral. I mean, how many hits did? Uh, it's definitely over 5 million, but only a million on my main YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. A lot of people stole the video, but it's all right. It helped to spread the word. So basically, I started the channel in the beginning of 2019. And like I said, I wanted to go over the top with everything I did. I had a video where I ate snake meat mm -hmm. while holding a live snake. Okay. Down by myself in Meitha. Okay. And then uh, I had a video where I eat coconut worms, which okay. is already, you know, extreme for some people. But I said, I've never found a video where a coconut worm bites somebody. So I let it bite me. And then I got to pull it off my lip. Oh. And then I eat it. Oh, okay. uh, and then I had how, a one. How did you get it to bite you? I just held it there. All they do is burrow. So they have oh. these little pinchers. Okay. But again, none of these videos really took off, but it set the tone of over the top things that I've never seen anyone else do. Uh, people eat mam tom, okay. you know, and it's it's not good for foreigners, but it's not also it's also not a viral video to eat it. So I drank a whole bowl of it, oh, okay. you know. Okay. Again, extreme. 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 Okay. But then a buddy of mine, um, we've been here since the beginning. We both started teaching English together, um, our language school, and he said, uh, you know, we need to do something that no one's ever seen and that the whole country is going to remember you for. Mm. So we sat down. And we started throwing ideas. It's like, what if you get a a pet? but it's a, not a traditional pet, it's a, a chicken. It's not a dog or a cat. And then what if you get a chicken and you try to cockfight with other people, but you actually got a hen and it's not a cockfighting chicken. Uh, okay. And then we went down that, that, that uh, path and basically it's a foreigner who speaks Vietnamese, but doesn't understand all the aspects of the culture. Mm -hmm. So I go to get a traditional outfit, but it's a traditional women's outfit. Uh -huh. I'm wearing women's okay. pajamas. Okay. I go get a traditional pet, but it's not a cockfighting chicken, it's a hen. Mm -hmm. And I go around, and through the story it develops as I find out, ladies like, that's not Ao Yai, that's pajamas. I'm like, oh, really? I thought it was Ao Yai. And then I tell people, you know, sometimes dogs are stolen here for food. So I was afraid to get a dog, so I got a chicken. Mm -hmm. Ironically, at the end of the video, I leave it tied up outside of my house, and my sister-in-law takes it, cooks it, and eats it in front of me. What? Yes. Okay. So the whole twist came to an end, yeah, yeah. and everything was not as I expected. That's like a Netflix movie, man. Yeah, I had a lot of a yeah, lot of yeah. plot twists in there, but basically, uh, from there, I had my own TV show on HTV within two months, uh -huh. um, and then that role led me to be in a movie. She quatch him to eat with Vo Tan Hoa. He he messaged me on it in Facebook and said, "Hey, I want you in my movie, but you're gonna dress just like your chicken video." Okay. I said perfect. Yeah, so yeah. from there, you know, TV shows, and I went from 900 subscribers after starting the channel for four months to 50,000 in about one month. Oh, wow, okay, okay, so that critical mass. And oh, what yes. are you at right now? Uh, at the moment, about 500,000. Okay. Yeah, so 100,000 a year. Yeah, and then do you see yourself uh, continuing this path as a YouTuber, 
And then if you're looking to springboard to do more or different revenue streams. Yes, of course. So uh, as most of you might know, or maybe you don't, you know, the, the ad revenue on YouTube depends on your audience. And being that in the beginning, 90% of my audience was Vietnam, while the ad revenue was much lower than it would be if my audience was in America oh, right, or right Australia. Yeah. So with that, you, it's very difficult to make a comfortable living off of a strictly Vietnamese audience. Therefore, you have to monetize through other means. Yeah. Um, so actually, you were the inspiration for one. I talked to you during the Netflix event. Huh. You talked to me about Amazon drop shipping. Yeah. So since that talk, I've set up on Amazon where now I sell t-shirts uh, related to my channel. Um, I started doing cameos this year. Yeah. Birthdays, weddings, things like that. And as you mentioned before, I started teaching Vietnamese. Yeah. Um, but we could save that for a later clip if it's not with the YouTube. But yeah, through that, basically the YouTube covers uh, comedy overall, but food reviews, travel reviews, teaching Vietnamese, and just overall life in Vietnam because my foreign audience, they are interested in daily life in Vietnam. Yeah. So one of the things that's kind of very difficult for many YouTubers is once you build a certain audience base, mm -hmm. and then you want to switch the audience base, uh, it's a risk. It is. Or you got to do a whole new channel. Exactly. And then do you want to start over? Is that something that you're positioning yourself to do? Uh, yes, I think I'm already in that path because as I mentioned, the first year was about 90% Vietnamese. Yeah. And now, five years later, yeah. it's split down the middle. It's 50% okay. Vietnam, 50% America. Oh. Ever since I started teaching Vietnamese, it turns yeah. out, I didn't know this, but a lot of Vietnamese born in America don't speak Vietnamese that well. Yeah, okay. And I get those compliments all the time. And I actually have Vietnamese people worldwide that learn Vietnamese from me. Okay. Because they, because you learned it from zero. Yes. So it's the same struggle that they would go through, mm -hmm. regardless if you're already Vietnamese, but you don't have any Vietnamese background. You're just a non-Vietnamese learning it. Yep. Okay. Well, we definitely have to have an affiliate program for that. Because we do have a lot of our expats who want to retire, want to do business here. Mm -hmm. And many of our big you who don't speak Vietnamese, Yes. that want to learn it from an American perspective, which is much easier. Because I know you do a lot of references to American culture, mm -hmm. to uh, idioms, that's easy for them to remember. And talk about my personal struggles as a foreigner trying to yeah. learn. This word sounds like this word, so I think of it like this here, you know, so. Yeah, yeah. So are you doing a whole platform to teach Vietnamese? Yes, so now I have a Patreon, and uh, this came from a, a, a need in the market. Whereas a lot of people on Instagram message me, can you teach me Vietnamese? Well, I don't have time to do private tutoring, you know, but I taught English for eight years. I understand the concept of getting a language across. Mm -hmm. So I said, you know, instead of building a course, instead of writing a book on this topic, I'm just gonna do a Patreon. I upload weekly lessons. If you sign up, you get access to all the previous lessons. Mm -hmm. And basically, if you want to learn how to flirt in Vietnamese, if you want to learn how to talk to your boss, at your workplace, yeah, yeah. I make a lesson specific to your request. Great, great. Well, let us be on your affiliate program for that. All right, let's go. Just because the need is there. I think you, you're a great teacher. Thank you, sir. I learned quite a few words from you as well. I, I've been learning Vietnamese for like 20 something years, but I always learn something new because the way you teach it is very easy to understand. Thank you, sir. I appreciate yeah, yeah. that. Cool, cool. Well, I mean, we're going to switch gears a little bit. So we already talked about his personal life, talked about his uh, current and future and amazing career as a, oh, not a YouTuber, but uh, an influencer. And then we'll switch a little bit, talk about some legal matters and also about his future goals as well. So as you stated, you know, you came to Vietnam and you loved the place and then you started your YouTube channel. But I guess on an alter alternate life, what have would have done if you didn't go down this path and being a successful YouTuber? That's a great question. Um, so I think a lot of it comes through meeting my wife, okay? And when you talk about the idea of fate, then mun in Vietnamese, you know, you can either believe that things happen for a reason, or you can believe that you make the best choices with whatever happens. And meeting my wife, I had a choice to either pursue that relationship or just become someone that travels a lot and is based in Vietnam. Okay. So if I would not have continued with her, chances are I wouldn't have been as proficient in Vietnamese. Chances are I wouldn't have uh, been as, as settled down as I am and I would have just been a travel vlogger. Okay. You know, that, that was my goal. But actually I had a friend who went to about 60 countries. We went to Laos and Japan together and his goal was to hit every country. He didn't do it. And I, I looked at it like, well, if I don't have the goal to hit every country, if I'm not gonna go to 
dangerous places in the world, like yeah. what's the point of trying to do all of them and miss a few, you know? Yeah, so yeah. it kind of changed my idea on that and I just pursued my relationship instead. Awesome, awesome. And then you can, you know, us men, we need a foundation, we need a rock so that we can, or what they call the uh, mountain, so you can soar and fly. Yes, if exactly. If you just fly all the time, you don't know where you're going. Exactly. So, so I think it's a good thing to have met your wife and to do what you're doing now. But of course, doing what you're doing now is great. But uh, we talked about it before, you know, different things you can springboard to. Mm -hmm. And I know you've done some acting. Uh, you also have a business as well. Aside from those, what are some of your future plans um, that maybe we can help you out with or mm -hmm. maybe other of our audience uh, that can help you out with as well? Well, as a general goal, I had an IELTS student of mine ask me this question. He said, what is your final goal with all of this? And I said, you know what, money's great, fame is great. Those are good things to have, but in the end, you know, I want every Vietnamese, not only in Vietnam, but throughout the world, if mm -hmm. someone comes up to you when you're in America and they say, hey, Ken, uh, are there any foreigners that know about your culture, that speak your language? I want their first answer to be Phuc Ma. Like, that's my goal is to touch everybody, but like yeah. in a positive way. Yeah. Not like, oh, that guy just teaches people how to say bad words. That guy is a disgrace to our culture. Mm -hmm. No, I want people to have a positive mindset. They don't all have to like me yeah. or even be a fan, but yet they know that, hey, he put in the work and he spreads positivity about my culture. Yeah. Um, so Respect aside from, you for the work that you do. Exactly, Respect. exactly. So uh, using that, just building the business and being a good example and being a good influence of Vietnam and its culture. All right, so we know a lot of people want to move to Vietnam and live here, uh, but it's really not for everybody. So I want to ask you, since you kind of came into the lifestyle, you love the life here, and now you're actually doing business and making money in Vietnam uh, while traveling the world. So can you give us like three to five nuggets of goods and bads about living here in Vietnam? Yeah, we'll start with the good. You know, everyone is very friendly. So when it comes to somebody learning this language, almost every Vietnamese person you meet on the street is interested to talk to you and listen to your Vietnamese. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I've never had an issue with practicing my Vietnamese and being that Saigon is like the New York City of Vietnam. You have people from all over the country, different voices, accents, and slang. You know, you have the opportunity to get a lot of listening practice as well. Now that being said, on the negative side, people are very touchy. They, there is not a concept of personal space. You ever rub like, your head? Exactly. Rub my head. I know I'm gaining weight because they've been rubbing my belly oh, a lot lately. Okay. And they're very direct. Whereas in America, I could never imagine coming up to a random person and be like, wow, you look like you've been gaining weight, huh? Yeah, yeah, Eating yeah. too much. People yeah. tell me all the time. I'm used to it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, it's good they're friendly. It's bad with that. Now, they're too friendly. Too friendly. Exactly. Yeah. They're, they're giving you that intervention that you don't want. Um, another thing behind us, you can see the traffic. Uh, it's very, a lot of my friends have described it as very like independent and free to be able to jump on a motorbike and go wherever you want. So that is one good aspect. The downside is that there is a lot of traffic. There are 10 million people in the city. So you leave at seven in the morning or five at night, the rush hour is going to be a bit crazy. And uh, the next one uh, I would say is uh, trash. You know, uh, a common cultural thing in Vietnam is to put your trash outside next to the road. It gets picked up at night, but unfortunately, it doesn't always get picked up completely. And it's also instilled in people that they can put their trash on the curb to be picked up. So I've had friends come here that say, uh, it's a bit dirty with the trash on the side of the road. So that is one thing that I would say you have to be uh, mindful of when you come. Yeah, yeah. Well, we definitely did our video about that as well, about the uneven sidewalks, uh, non-handicap accessible. Of course, the trash, it gets, it gets picked up at night, but you gotta smell it the whole day. Yeah, or if it rains, for example, in my neighborhood up in Dunbun, oh, yeah, if it yeah. rains before they pick it up, the floods take the bag and it blocks the drain. Yeah. And we've had flooding like this high in front of my door and it's uh, like, and it turns out it's just a bag over the drain. But I'm sure you did a swimming video. Oh, about well. <laughs> <laughs> swimming and rowing in we, the rain. We've had a couple of those. Those are viral TikTok clips right there, but. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't wear my suit to go in there or else I do a video myself. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, so that's, uh, you know, thank you for sharing. I, I know you love Vietnam, so anything you say, it's really just positive criticism. Oh yeah. Because of the love of the country and it's the true reality of living in Vietnam. But in order to live here, you gotta be 
funny, you gotta find it funny, and you gotta laugh about the lifestyle, and you really see all the great things about Vietnam. And right. you realize, like, this, this country is more developed than other countries around this area, but it's still developing. So you have to uh, thong cam, as they say in Vietnamese. Yeah. You have to empathize with what's going on. People are getting uh, more developed. They're, they're gaining uh, more knowledge about how things are done uh, with uh, sanitary items, things like this, over in the, the West. But uh, it's one of those things that you have to realize here. And then once you understand that it's going to happen, you know, people, the way they drive yeah. in traffic, then you can uh, live here a lot more comfortably. Yeah, you just enjoy it and relax. But that's where we transition over to the important questions, the legal questions. Mm. And as an attorney interviewing you, I'm going to go to some hard hitting questions, but we probably okay. have to go find a place to sit. All right. Soon. So let's we'll do come it. right back. All right, brother. All right, man. So I have to hit you with the hard-hitting legal questions. So we got to take a seat. Of make course. Sure everything is good. Make sure I'm based. I'm ready for this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, many of, uh, as an attorney uh, in the United States and being here in Vietnam for about 10 years, um, many foreigners want to know about immigration status. You know, for since you've been here quite a long time, you know, a year, two, three years at a time. Uh, what are some of your strategies that you employ for the short term? 30, 60, 90 days, mm -hmm. uh, midterm like a year, and then if you have a longer term strategy, three to five years. Right. Uh, to be honest with you, people ask me a lot of questions about immigration, which is a reason I'm excited to talk to you so I can have more answers on that, but I've always had the easy route. Uh, I started working at VUS back in 2014, and since then they've always handled my visa. I've never had to do a border run. They covered the visa fee. I just give them my passport and two years at a time with the temporary residence card yep. and work permit. But uh, as you already know, last year I, I left the job of teaching English, although I do love it. And uh, I was at the same center for you know eight years straight, had the same kids as they grew up. It was amazing oh, wow. to see. Okay. Um, I had to focus more on my channel. So since then, I have uh, got the uh, five-year visa, okay. five-year five marriage visa, okay. and to me, right now, that, that's good enough, but I'm sure there are steps I can take in the future to have even more long-term. Okay, okay. So the five-year visa exemption gives you six months at a time, so you can stay here, do your work, travel around, and then come back. Exactly. But, well, I mean, definitely in the future, there are a couple other visas available, uh, investor visa, since you'll be doing a lot of business here, maybe put a team together. Um, like that. That's what. I mean, this is more of a personal question, but um, many of our clients run into immigration matters too. Uh, have you ever run into any immigration matters? They didn't let you out of the country. They didn't let you in the, the country. Yeah. Um, so I've been late on turning in my passport to my school before, and late as in I'm about to take my trip back to America, and if I don't renew the visa before I leave then getting back in the country is gonna be very difficult. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but on top of that, during uh, the COVID time, I believe it was April, 2020, they shut down. Yeah. Okay, and they basically said, you know, if you're a foreigner and you're here, you stay. Yeah. And if you leave, you don't come back. Yeah. So being that my wife was here, my puppy was here, I just um, made the decision to not leave. And I don't think I went back home until the end of 2022. Oh, okay. So, so I came so back beginning yeah. of 2020 and almost 2023, three years. Yeah, wow, okay. So that I would say that was the biggest issue. And since then, you know, luckily we've had the chance to travel around. So because your Vietnamese is at a very high level, it's very good. Uh, also, your wife is Vietnamese and then your future children. Have you thought about getting Vietnamese citizenship or did you look into that? I've considered it, but I don't know much about the process. My, my first question would be, would I have to give up my U.S. citizenship to get that? Okay. So the answer is no. Okay, that's good. Yep. Um, so there are about four things that you would need to uh, show in order to get your Vietnamese citizenship as a non-Vietnamese. It's a different path for Vietnamese overseas. Yeah, I can imagine. But as a foreigner, we actually have a lot of potential clients who want to get it. So one is you got to show your uh, Vietnamese proficiency. Mm -hmm. Two is that you've lived in Vietnam for a total of five years. Okay. Uh, also, if you can show more ties to Vietnam, such as you know, wife and kids who are Vietnamese and Vietnamese citizens, uh, and then substantial contribution to Vietnam, either economic, social, charitable. So those are some things that you would have to do okay. um, in order to become a Vietnamese citizen uh, in the future. 
well, the first, the last three, I feel like I would be uh, very good at. Uh, the proficiency test, reading and writing has always been my strong point. So as long as it involves some of that, it would be all right. Um, yeah, I think I would be able to do it. Okay. I, I would love, I would love to go through with it, knowing that I don't have to give up the U.S. citizenship. Right. One of my first, uh, you know, questions about it was at the times that my wife, Vietnamese citizen, has traveled with me. We went to uh, Korea, we went to uh, Taiwan, and both of those visas for her were rather difficult. Korea, we had to go to the consulate like six times. We didn't get her visa until the day we were about to fly. So seeing her struggle and just going to another country, I was like, well. The American passport, I just walk right in. There's no question. So that was my first concern with it. You know, as U.S. citizens, we can sponsor our spouses to the United States. Uh, have you started that process, or are you in that process? And yes, I guess how. It so with that process, um, my wife actually has her green card now. Awesome. Oh, so okay. she can go back and forth freely, and uh, she, you know, we're here right now together, and it's a 10 year because we were married for over two years when she got it, yeah. and. Eventually, speaking of citizenship, I would like to get her U.S. citizenship just so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, so yeah. she'll have both, and then obviously knowing you, it's a good person to know if I want to go through with the Vietnamese citizenship. My, my thing with the Vietnamese citizenship, though, is that as much as I feel I've contributed to the society, and as much as I'm recognized on the street here, and as much as I love Vietnam, you know, one thing that always stands out is that Vietnam is a homogenous society. Whereas, you know, even um, other Asians, you know, they're considering going to Hawaii, they are foreigners. And it's not in a hateful way, it's not in a racist way, it's just you're either Vietnamese or you're not. So even being completely fluent with the language in the future, having a Vietnamese wife, being here a long time, walking down the street holding my Vietnamese passport, I feel like a lot of people would still just consider me a foreigner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a little bit harder to pass muster yeah. uh, as a Vietnamese. Sometimes I have trouble passing muster as a Vietnamese, <laughs> and I, I was born here. Uh, the other one is many of our audience as well is uh, having children. As a U.S. citizen, having a child in Vietnam, um, did you get the U.S. citizenship for your child? Oh, I no kids yet. Okay. No kids yet, so uh, obviously, that will be the main goal so that they can travel freely and there's no issue with going to America. But uh, yeah, my wife and I, we've just waited until we get everything stable owned in before uh, deciding on the child. Well, you're definitely gonna need me then. Yes, sir. Because as, a, uh, as an American uh, giving birth to a child, do birth rights, then your child's automatically a US citizen. Uh, you do what's called the consular report of birth abroad. Okay. Uh, there's going to be some nuances in there, so I mean, I guess I'll take this time to kind of advise you and advise our audience at the same time, uh, is the laws have changed, especially for if you have dual passports. So if you ever have a Vietnamese passport, you have to submit all documentation to get the birth certificate. Right. If, the, if your child is born in Vietnam, uh, all your documentation for the government in the Vietnamese passport. But that creates a problem because the birth certificate will say, you know, Brandon Hurley, Vietnamese citizen, giving birth to a Vietnamese person. Wife is Vietnamese, everybody's Vietnamese. Then you gotta prove you're an American. Exactly. So that takes one extra step that you'd have to do in order to prove. And there are a few steps that you have to prove that you're a US citizen, including tax filing for five years. Okay. okay. Uh, so let me ask on that, what if it's the opposite? So let's say my wife is Vietnamese citizen, I'm American citizen, the baby's born in America, right? Yeah. What rights does the baby have to be a citizen here? Yeah, so uh, the same similar uh, process as a uh, child to a Vietnamese citizen who is born abroad yes. will still have rights to Vietnamese citizenship. Okay. But now they got to prove it again. Yeah, so you're born in America with a U.S. birth certificate to an American father and a Vietnamese mother. And the Vietnamese mother now has U.S. citizenship. So you got to decide what is her citizenship on the birth certificate. Ah. If it's like American and American, right? Yep. Then she's got to prove she's Vietnamese. Okay. Right. So you have that, that, that kind of reverse process as well. So for the audience watching that's in a situation like that, would is that something you'd be able to help with as well? Getting yes. the Vietnamese citizenship? Yeah, yeah. So we do multiple citizenships, uh, helping get the Vietnamese citizenship, registration of uh, marriage certificates, 
And we actually do sponsorships to the U.S. Okay. I don't know. Uh, did you do your own file or did? Oh uh, uh, yes. So. Okay. That that was an interesting yeah, process. Tell me about your story. Like I said, I did four years of pre-law, but never went to law school. Okay. And I said, no, I can do this myself. And uh, yeah, that was um, a very long and drawn out process. I think COVID really hurt it, being that the consulate was basically shut down outside of emergencies. Yeah. So I think that delayed the process quite a bit. But um, a, a good example, my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, they got married one week before us in 2018. Okay. So we go, we go to her hometown, we get married, they get married, we come back here, uh, my wife and I get married. They applied for the green card right away. She was there before 2020, took one year. We apply in 2019 because I'm not trying to leave. I just wanted to get her, you know, her green card. Yeah. Man, it didn't come through until the end of 2022. Wow, okay, three years later. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I guess that positions our law firm in a good state. Yes. We've done hundreds of them. Get a lawyer, everyone. Uh, Save a lot of time. Yeah, a lot of time, headache, and uh, preparation, and you can, uh, and even save the marriage. Yes. You don't have to argue back and forth oh, of yes. uh, legitimacy of the marriage. Many times the situation is marriages are real, oh, but yeah. you're just too lazy to prove it. And the consulate doesn't believe you. Unfortunately, Vietnam is a high-risk country. Mm -hmm. uh, they assume that most of the marriage petitions are fake. Yes. And, and uh, it's completely understandable because yeah. my friends have been approached by families here offering $50,000, $70,000 to fake marry their daughter yeah, to bring yeah, them to America. Right. And I've heard that multiple times. So in, in the in the consulate, they have signs warning, if you see fraud, say something, you know, yeah, if you yeah. know about this. Uh, but luckily my wife and I, we've, tri we've traveled to Malaysia, Thailand, Indonesia, Taiwan, Korea, all around Vietnam. We had the pictures, we had the tickets of, you know, five years of marriage. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, we were, we were set. Okay, good, good, putting it all together. And she's older than me by one month, so. I wasn't yeah. marrying down <laughs> 20 <laughs> years below. Be like, wait a minute, hold on a second. Yeah, yeah. Well, 20 years below, <laughs> that'll be illegal. <laughs> you okay. Can't do that, yes. Brother. In three more years, you know what I mean. Yes. <laughs> the other thing about um, work is uh, I actually have a movie production company. Really? Called East Films. Okay. And uh, that's why I was at the Netflix event. Uh, director Ham Tran. I don't know if you know him yet. Sounds familiar, uh, but I don't think we've ever met. Yeah, he's actually working for Netflix as a consulting director. Um, he will, semi-public information, he'll be directing the first Netflix original Vietnam movie. Oh, wow. So he did movies like uh, How to Fight in Six Inch Heels, Bitcoin Heist, uh, more recently, Bang Gato Le Sef. So he's done about seven or eight movies in Vietnam. Wow. Um, he has a couple others out as well. So him and Fancy Ne, do you know Fancy Ne? Fan Yan Yuklin. We, we may have met. Uh, every time I go to an event or a TV show, I meet a lot of people. And yeah, yeah. Okay. In Vietnam, everyone has the same Vietnamese name, so they okay, get mixed okay. up easily without a face. We're gonna try to, we'll try to get you into the circle. Maybe you can come have cigars and whiskey with us. Let me know. Uh, we do it once a month. But with that said, uh, what are you projecting for your, maybe, I would say cinema or film career first? And then we'll springboard, you know, TV shows. I know you like to do those as well. Yeah, you know, uh, honestly, I look at that as more of a hobby than a career. Okay. You know, I, I, I'm very humble about it in that I don't consider myself a great actor when it comes to someone else's script. I'm a great natural improv actor. Yep, yep. But when there's a set script and I have to remember lines, especially in Vietnamese, it doesn't come off as natural and I don't consider myself that good. Okay. But when they put me on TV, like the Hang Game Dem, and it's two days of me just, as they say, through y'all, through law, saying and doing whatever I want yeah. with what's going on, yeah. I do great. So I'm not, I don't want to uh, base my future career goals on being an actor. Okay. I would love to be in movies yeah. and be in TV shows, but if it doesn't happen, also not that big of a deal. You know, I, I have more time to pursue what I want with yeah. my channel and, and make my own content. Okay, awesome. Maybe just one springboard uh, to many of the other media that you use. Mm -hmm. right. No, I mean, yeah, when the opportunity's there, if I get a call for a game show today, I'm saying, well, I'll be there. But I'm also not hiring a manager to go and find these opportunities for me. They know where to message me, and just as before, hey, you want to be on this show? Great, I'll do it. Go from there. Okay, awesome, awesome.
All right, man, Phuc Map. It's always been great to talk to you, hear your story, but also let our audience hear your story as well. And I wish you the best of luck in all that you do. Hopefully, we'll connect on the films, uh, connect on other collaborations, uh, and then be able to do other videos with you as well. And of course, if you need any legal advice, we're here for the business side and the law side. I appreciate um, that. But with that said, man, uh, anything you want to say to our audience? You know, I just want to say the first time I met Ken, I'd seen him online. You know, we hadn't really talked much before, but we met. He's a very uh, dynamic person, very positive person, and I'm sure uh, your legal work reflects that as well. So it's always a pleasure talking to you, and I feel like, you know, just as the Amazon idea, I feel like you always spark something new in my head and say, oh, maybe I should try that. So I really appreciate the time and bringing me on your channel and hopefully my interview can help some of you have a better life in Vietnam in the future. Yeah, or at least a good haircut. Yes. But we can't tell you where to go. <laughs> uh, so with that said, uh, my name is Ken Jung. You know, thank uh, Phuc Map for being on our show. But as always, uh, just make sure that you like our Facebook page, subscribe to our YouTube channel, comment below how we did on our interview, what other things you want to know. And we'll definitely have links, uh, affiliate programs that we work with uh, Footmap as well. Uh, so with that said, thank you very much for watching this video and we'll see you on the next interview.